All right, hi everybody. Welcome to the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art. It's delightful to see all of you tonight at this program. Um, tonight we're gonna be having some conversations about matters of pride, both through art and through relationship. My name is Nick Schluter, and I am the education coordinator here at the museum. Before we get started with our presentation though, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land which we are gathered in within ancestral territory of the Squamish people of clear salt water. Ex expert fishermen, canoe builders, and basket weavers, the Squamish live in harmony with the lands and the waterways along Washington's central coast sea. As they have for thousands of years, here the Squabish live and protect the land and waters of their ancestors for future, generation, for future generations as promised by the Point Elliott Treaty of 1855. So we're gonna start off our conversation tonight talking about some of the art pieces and I'm gonna hand it over to our head curator, Greg Robinson, and we'll start from there. Um, thank you, Nick, very much. Thank you all for being here. And I just wanted to say that um, the, the title of the exhibition is called Matters of Pride. And of course, uh, pride in, in this case with um, all of us who are in the LGBTQ plus community um, comes um, not immediately in life, but through many, many other processes. Um, I was the 1979 male co-chair of the Seattle Lesbian and Gay Pride March when I was 21 years old, and I've had quite a journey. At the time, I worked for the Seattle Counseling Service for Sexual Minorities, um, training to be a counselor, and uh, which my clinical supervisor later talked me out of because I wasn't patient enough and all of that. And um, she said I should go into project management. But anyway, um, today isn't all about me. Um, but at, at that time, one of my jobs was to help the person in charge of the what was then called the transsexual support group. Um, everything was different then. Um, we were fighting over how wide the umbrella should be. Um, and I'm just so pleased personally where we are today compared to where we were, and of course not, not where we hope to be um, collectively. I'm really proud um, for the, of the response for the exhibition. We put out a, a call, an open call to the community and people helped us post and push out and we have quite a diverse exhibition. And what we wanted to do today was um, in preparation for the reception, which by the way is a big party in collaboration with the Hilltop Glass Artists, whose um, 30 anniversary, 30th anniversary show is also happening and we're going to have a combined party. But I thought we could get things mixing a little bit by having a few of the artists talk about the work they put in and um, who they are and why they've chosen to do the work that they do. We're going to start off, and I'll let people introduce themselves in um, more detail, but I'd like to um, introduce Catherine and Felix to come up first. Thank you very much. And, <laughs> and please do, uh, the party is from five till eight right after this. Um, we'll have food and drink. Please do stay. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Felix Serna. I use they, them pronouns. Um, this is my auntie, Catherine. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and our art, I don't know if this is going to be changing. Yes. Oh. oh. Wow. Oh, there we are. There we are. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yay. So, uh, this is uh, what we have so far for what I'm calling um, the Transcripts series, um, which has been a project to queer language, um, specifically bringing out uh, trans words, words that we use all the time, uh, transparent, uh, transaction, and transfixed. Um, my... Uh, 
I would say my motivation with this has been uh, really found in collaboration, um, kind of in intergenerationally, because <laughs> um, uh, the everything in in these uh, prints has been. Uh, I don't know. How would you? We've we well. Let me first <laughs> say I've been doing letterpress and making broadsides and prints and artist books for a little over 30 years. So I have the studio, I have the equipment, and um, Felix has been um, doing art together with me and their auntie, Aunt Kim, who's also here, ever since they were a child, and um, has always shown a lot of talent. And then, you know, later kind of time apart, not seeing each other for a while, and then coming together when Felix came out. And the broadsides, for me, were just a natural way to show love and support for Felix. And then also, we have a lot of fun. We love wordplay. We love jokes. Felix, I'm like twice Felix's age. Felix likes to laugh <laughs> at uh, old people, queer things. And... Um, <laughs> A lot of this just feeds into how we talk and develop the broadsides and think about what the message is, what we're trying to say. And um, I think Felix brings a lot of intensity and I bring a lot of- um, Whimsy. Oh, I was gonna say ignorance, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's where the whimsy comes from. And, you know, it's just been amazing. Uh, having a trans person in the family has taught me a lot about myself and my beliefs and my limited beliefs and how I see the world, um, has really been able to grow and transform. And that's what we're, I feel like we're bringing to the broadsides. Absolutely. Is a real love and embrace of transness and diversity in all of us. And, and just also a, um, you know, however terms have changed over the years, um, it's just been nice to know that, you know, no matter how I conceive of myself, what terms I use for myself, um, you know, I have... I'm a part of this queer history, like both just through my family, but just, th you know, throughout it, period. Um, and that's been really, I think, reflective in the work too, is that it's just, um, you know, I think we, we push for kind of a, a, an open dialogue mm -hmm. intergenerationally mm -hmm. with it. And as far as the printing goes, I just want to share that we're doing these rainbow colors, but we're using just three colors, yellow, blue, and red, and then mixing them in the printing process as they print over each other, which I love the way <laughs> Felix will talk about it. It feels like who we are and like what we're doing collaboratively, as well as what makes the process happen. Yeah, um, you know, to me, I think of it, um, and I, I think I mentioned it partially as a joke, but it's it's sort of like a layering of feminisms in a way. It's like, you know, I, I come in with my, my own experiences, my own ideas of um, how things are, are running, and then, you know, it gets completely upended because if you've ever looked at a press, it's sort of, how can we do art the hardest way possible? Um, and you know, I'm very, I'm very lucky to have somebody so experienced to just sort of help me walk it, walk through each and every step of that. Um, so that's been really cool too. And also, all the the word, the whole idea, like this is Felix's idea to take these words with trans as the root in them, and break them down and, and redefine them. And I'm really just supporting the process. I think as a trans person, one of the um, you know key things about coming out is that you're a familiar person to everybody in your life, but you're suddenly made different. You're suddenly new. And um, I, I love applying that idea to language. These are all familiar words. But when you start focusing on the trans aspect, they're each, each of them is different in a new way. And, uh, you know, that's been just really reflective of my experience thus far. Yeah. Thank you.
And now I would like to introduce Claire Johnson and just wanted to say the range of work in this show is so interesting to me and I find Claire's to be some of the more conceptual work with some of the symbolism and then of course very um, specific um, daily experiences with the post-it notes. Thank you very much. And you have a clicker here. I think we'll find out, okay. you know. We're, we're, we're all okay with um, any way at this point, right? Great. <laughs> um, Felix, are you also wearing a dinosaur shirt? I am. It's like the uniform yeah. for today. <laughs> we do what the assignment was. Absolutely. Okay, let's see about clickers. Oh, it's me. And you. Mm. I'm going the wrong way. Aha! All right. Um, my name is Claire Johnson. Uh, I am an artist and writer. I was so excited about this show um, because I love all things queer, but also because I loved that I um, that the show wasn't prescribing what um, LGBTQ needed to mean in terms of art. Um, I make several different, very different looking kinds of art and writing both. And um, to the extent where the last time I actually got to show so many of my kinds of work together in a formal space like this, it was for a solo show back when I lived in England. And people, multiple people wrote in the comments book, like, loved all the artists. This was so fun, you know? And I was like, oh, they were all me, but okay, good, good note for, for signage in the future. So, um, and some of the kinds of work I make, it, it might be really obvious to everyone that I'm that I'm gay, but uh, others, it might, you know, you might look at this painting and not necessarily know um, that uh, what a big part of it my queerness is. Um, so I make acrylic paintings of memories. Um, those were the first branch of my work, which I still make. I mean, I made made this one um, just about nine months ago. Um, the ones I chose for this show or to submit to this show have to do with um, family for me. Um, this is me with my parents um, uh, in a sort of familial place. Um, the memories can be private. Um, I don't need everyone to understand necessarily what um, what I was thinking of when I made them, but um, there is uh, some hidden queerness in my family. There is some um, mysterious sort of histories that I wonder about queerness, but people don't necessarily wonder other than me um, in the family history. Uh, um, that's often a part of my writing as well. Um, so a lot of these are of um, times when I was with uh, family members, people that I love. This one in particular, um, for me, this memory I will share with you uh, because this is my cousin and his daughter, um, and I am really, really close with them in a way where um, it feels like family on a different level than just um, she's my cousin's kid. Um, I want to be able to like help take care of her when I'm around, um, but you know they are not. My cousin is not queer, um, but he feels like a part of my chosen family almost. Um, we were also in a club space um, watching a concert that he and his wife had invited me to when I was in Idaho for a residency and um, their kid was falling asleep. Um, everyone else was really enjoying this concert which was the queerest crowd and the queerest concert. I could not believe the number of gay things they invited me to without realizing. Um, it was really magical. Um, this is another one that to me think, makes me think of sort of chosen family, queer family, also people in my life who have partnerships that are outside of the norm, um, the sort of the, what is assumed by a romantic partnership. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not necessarily a public thing, but just this, this has memories around that, that that make me think of that. Um, while I was in grad school, whoop. I also started making uh, post-it notes. I make a post-it note every night before bed to save something from the ending day. Um, they can be in any style, uh, whatever I feel like at the time. Um, 
They date back almost two decades now. I have thousands and thousands of them. Uh, I was saying to someone in the audience, if anybody wants to publish these as a book, please approach me about it. I would love to talk with you. Um, they, uh, they have to do with both my, um, both my need to hold on to things as they're passing, like I, I hate uh, losing each day, um, and also my lifelong insomnia. Um, these ones are from right after I moved back to Seattle, after my um, ex-wife uh, ended our relationship in England pretty suddenly. So this is sort of, these are the first year that I'm back in Seattle. We have a whole bunch of these. Oh, no, okay, so we're missing. All right, well, you can see the other post-its in the actual show. There's some enlargements of some other sets of them. Um, also, in the actual exhibition, you can see a bunch from this time last year, uh, both uh, Pride in Seattle, where I was last year at this time, but also um, there's a few in a case that are also from uh, Pride in Boise, where I was in September, and Boise Pride is in September. Um, interestingly enough. So uh, the post-its led to this part of my work. Um, these are dip pen drawings that are very intricate and meticulous. They're drawn by dipping a metal pen nib in a jar of ink. Um, they're often very small. Many of them are just slightly larger than a post-it, um, though I have expanded. There's a really big one in this show as well. Um, they came from, while I was drawing all these post-it notes, I found like every, every night, um, what I wanted to draw was things that had imagery that had comforted me as a kid. Um, tree houses, houses that, um, where you could sort of build all these different spaces inside the rooms that you could see. Um, uh, living spaces in um, the trunks of trees or um, fortresses, sort of like castles that were in a, some unreachable place. And they were things that I really enacted over and over again in my childhood art because of wanting to create a safe space for myself. Um, sc elementary school was a rough time for me. Um, I didn't know the way I didn't understand all the ways I was different at the time, um, but it seemed like other kids did. <laughs> um, and uh, drawing was something that really held me and kept me calm. Um, also through health problems, asthma attacks, all kinds of stuff. Um, so I found as I was doing these nightly post-its, I just wanted to draw the same thing over and over again as I approached bedtime. And I thought, I've got to give myself a different space for that, a more formal space, use fancier materials that will take me longer. I can spend more time in these spaces. Um, and that's when I started making these. Um, and you can see they have ridiculous details, like roller skates in a branch or the uh, um, swing over the ocean. Like, And the wonderful thing is that I don't have to be in charge of like how you would actually get to this space or the realism of it, or even you know something that would be terrifying like roller skating on a tree branch is just funny in this case. And it's very transformative for me. So they're a huge part of my coping mechanism as a queer person. Um, they also have titles that are relating to what I was thinking about or experiencing during the time period that I was making the drawing, which is a nod back to the post-it notes. So this one is called One or Two Lumps. Um, I liked that it was ambiguous and people might not know what it was of, whether it was like sugar for tea or, um, or what, though what I was thinking about was waiting to find out whether my, mom, um, whether my mom's breast cancer was one or two lumps. Um, this one's called, Hey, Remember When We Used to Talk All the Time? Um, and this one is really post-it size, pretty much it's, it's four by four inches. The drawings have recently, in the last three or four years, expanded into public art, which is the one kind of my work that you're not going to see in the show in the museum here. Um, for the public art process, I do color in the art. Um, I don't tend to do that for my individual pieces, but, um, Lots of public art processes or uh, situations really ask for a bright color. So I hand color them with watercolor. 
Um, these were from one that was a temporary project for the AIDS Memorial Pathway in Cal Anderson Park in Seattle. And the originals, which are what these, these are like the, the individual paintings, those are on display at Gay City right now in Seattle, um, Seattle's LGBTQ plus center. Um, they're in their lobby. Um, this is what they look like on the building where they were installed. So they encircled the building in a rainbow. And they were talking about um, four different people's experiences, sort of four different long-term survivors, different experiences with HIV and family. These, these five along the water were about vertical transmission, so someone who'd been born with HIV and um, survived uh, and became an HIV AIDS educator. Um, these are on the backs of traffic signs in West Seattle. They're like an art scavenger hunt. And this is my first permanent mural. It, it's still in process of going up. Um, only some of the panels are installed, but it's in Burien um, at a DESC building uh, that provides permanent supportive housing. Um, so yeah, I've been excited to have my work go into public art where everyone can see it for free as part of their normal life. But I'm also really excited to get to show my individual pieces here um, in this exhibition tonight, because they are so personal to me and to who I am as a queer person, even if um, even if it might be more subtle than in you know than in some things. So you can see a lot of rainbows in the post-its that I put out. Um, and if you have any questions for me about anything, um, just come find me at the reception. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you, guys. And we have one last artist presenting, Sarah Guthrie. And, um, and then I, before we, and I know Nick will introduce Eve, but I just wanted to say um, that Eve Pillay is re really responsible for a lot of, bringing a lot of love and hard work to BEMA and helping us to further enhance our relationships within the trans community. So when we get to the second half of the program, I just want to have given a shout out to Eve in advance. Thank you very much. And um, Sarah, please join us. Hi. Hey, that's me. That's me also. My name is Sarah C.B. Guthrie. I am the artist who brings you joy. I am based in Seattle. Um, my husband and I have been living there since about 2012. It was a pretty significant year here in Washington State could it, because it's the year that same-sex marriage became legal. And it's kind of hard to believe that was that long ago and also that recently. Um, I, I'm an artist ally. I have, um, my allyship and activism has grown over the years and has started in several ways. This is, one, one place it began was an education process I went through when I was managing the benefits function for a large university on the East Coast. We were one of the very first universities to put trans, um, benef transgender benefits in place. And I was, I didn't, this was the early aughts. So there was not as much pub, broad public awareness of transgender identity and issues and what it is and how you go through that. Um, and so it was an education process for me as a cis hetero person. Is how, what is this and how can I support the people that are gonna be taking advantage of these benefits? And I was really grateful for the people who, on, who were on staff and who were students. One of them is Sarah McBride, who's the first state senator in Delaware, who collaborated with me and helped educate me on, on what's involved and gave me things to read and really helped me understand the challenges the community faced and, and all that's involved with making that those very big decisions. And I was really grateful for that education. I was really grateful for their compassion and assuming that I would be open and listening. That was a special gift that I received. And so this piece is painted in honor of 
all transgender people. It's based on the transgender pride flag. And that flag was originally designed by um, a woman who was in the, a submariner in the Navy before transitioning. And what I, what I wanted to share in this piece was just the awe that I felt about the bravery that it takes to go through, to, to make that decision, to, to claim one's identity publicly. It's not an easy decision, and I was really impressed with the bravery. So this piece celebrates the bravery of all transgender people. You are my joy icons. Um, I have two other pieces in the show as well. Another one is called Celebrate Pride, and it's based on the original pride flag that was commissioned by Harvey Milk. He also commissioned that from an army veteran. And that piece um, includes the colors we know today in the pride flag, but also turquoise and pink. And it was meant to show more the, the subtlety of, of, of the spectrum. And I really, I just loved it aesthetically, and so created this piece from that. And one of the things I read very recently was that the that original pride flag, which of which there are two that include the pink and the turquoise, at some point got changed to the six colors we know now because the fabric of turquoise and pink was hard to find or something, um, or made the flag, flags too expensive. Um, and then the third piece that I have in this exhibit is a non-binary pride flag that was designed by an artist in 2014. And one of the reasons I love the flag so much is working in joy. I love working in color, and I love the boldness of, these, of the colors of the flag, so I respond to them at an aesthetic level. But I also respond to them as a sense of connection. You know, the flags signify you're seen, you're safe, this is a welcoming place. Be who you are here. You are welcome to be who you are here. And that's very, very meaningful to me. And so I'm really grateful for this opportunity to exhibit here. And Sarah, yes. I, I have a question. Sure. A comment. Please. Um, it was really fun for me to be on the retreat. A lot of you narrative. We're in this era where, or as a storyline, we're in this era where difference is so important. It's an important question. There's no difference between the two. So it's, it's really very interesting. Right. Well, having grown up as a Gen Xer in the rainbow and unicorn sticker generation, I really <laughs> I respond to it at that level as well. But thank you for calling out one of the things I really want to show in this, and that was what I learned in the education process, was the fluidity of this process of transgender. Like, there are different, there's, there's, there's a whole rainbow within that, and so I, I didn't want to have the starkness of a white section, a pink section, a blue section, and so forth. I wanted to show that because that was one of my big takeaways was there are so many different ways in which to express one's gender. Thank you. All right, thank you, presenting artists. We're gonna transition now to our next section of our program, and we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into some conversations with some family members and talk about, um, we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into the trans conversation on a lot of different levels, and Eve Pillay is going to lead that conversation. There'll be a panel of guests, and so I'd like to invite Eve up to give 
this audience an idea of who you are and what you're about, and then secondarily, what this panel is going to be about and who's invited to sit at it. So welcome, Eve Pillay. Thank you. I don't need to use this. Yay. <laughs> I really like these. I want you to know that I am a ally artist ally. <laughs> when I saw this, when I saw this in the hall and the pride one, Spirit of Pride, I looked at it and I thought, They've got the labels mixed up. So I, I went and talked and told them, those labels are mixed up. And then I spent the rest of the night when I went home saying, maybe that was intentional. <laughs> Damn, those artists. Um, thank you all for being here. Welcome to this event. Well, just welcome, because this is a welcoming. It is a welcoming of art. It is a welcoming of allies. It is a welcoming into the 21st century for some people. Um, I am in awe of the people who do the art here. You, yeah, you, yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's all incredible. And I wish I would be able to just do that, spend you know, 55 hours doing that instead of saying, OK, what am I going to say? This, this is a welcoming. And first off, I'm Eve Pillay. I'm um, with Lynn Flowers, the Bainbridge chapter of the Rainbow Crew Northwest, which works to connect queer and trans communities in Bainbridge, Polsbo, Port Townsend, Port Angeles, and other points in this area. Um, I prefer saying queer and trans because that way I don't feel like I'm li leaving anybody out. Um, and the LGBTQIA plus two um, can get a little difficult, especially when you're you know, hearing it from the people at the city council doing their proclamation. And they've got to say those letters over and over again. And it's just like, OK. I just go for queer and trans. Um, but I've also been you know, part of the board of Bainbridge Pride, with, you know, which usually puts on an event, the Pride Fest. Uh, Derek is very busy with you know, opening a second shop, um, Millstream, up in Port Townsend. So we are doing that as part of Rainbow Crew Northwest. Um, the Queer Elders Family Group at the Senior Center, and Transfriending, which is a support group for families with trans people in it. And so we're really looking forward to all of you being here and all of you telling your friends that July 27th, Saturday, at Waterfront Park, right over here, we will be having our you know, Bainbridge Island Pride Fest. Great time, 12 to 8, the last two hours, our queer prom. So feel ready, feel, be ready, feel good, be happy. And being happy is part of what Pride Month is about. I was thinking about this, you know, that even during the worst of the AIDS crisis, as angry as people were, Pride was a celebration. And we need to keep in mind that it is the celebration that we are here for. That we are welcoming new people into the queer and trans community all the time. That there are difficulties that are in the newspaper every day and on the radio. Radio? On the stream. <laughs> And that we end up getting defined by our troubles. And we are more than our troubles. We are more than our troubles. And I so much salute the resilience of everyone in our community. 
and the way to keep moving forward and understanding that everything that we are working towards is an aspiration. It's what we're trying to get closer to, not something we expect to attain. And when we do attain things like gay marriage, we find that people still want to take it away. Anyway, that's enough of my thing here. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists. Nick gets to come back up here. Um, I don't know if it's Schluter or... You nailed it. Schluter. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Nick Schluter. Thanks. Nick works with the museum. Um, Shannon Dowling. And don't, don't go every other one, all right? Just pick the three middle ones. Okay, I don't want you guys you know, deciding you have to have space. <laughs> Shannon is an incredible community member in the theater community, in the music community here on Bainbridge. And I didn't first want to say, I didn't know Nick at all until this spring. I've known Shannon for years now, but haven't been in touch and didn't know that Shannon had a trans kid. I was actually in touch with Shannon about music for the event. And our friend um, Talina mentioned this. And I said, oh, really? Cool. Um, and Etiana Wright, who is someone that I describe as a gender refugee of a family of gender refugees who's left Louisiana and recently come to Bainbridge Island working at um, St. Barnabas, if I have that right. I always get Barnabas' name wrong. You know, I want to say Bartleby, but no, it's St. <laughs> Barnabas. Um, and what we're going to talk about here are the three questions that I will pose to each one of them, though not in order or in my order, not, not just, you know, ask them to remember what I just said, you know. Um, the word I'm saying now, I'll say, what I'm saying now is what matters, not what I said then. And they are, how did you get here? What was the second one I told you? <laughs> what is it like to find community? What does that mean to you? And what has transition both what has been good about it and really difficult, and it is often incredibly difficult. What has that, how has that helped you grow as a person and as a family? And so I'm going to start with Etienne. I have to put the ah. It's not Etienne, it's Etienne. Ah. Um, how did you get here? Well, if you ask my son Samuel, he'll say on a plane. <laughs> um, well, I am a I am a mom of three amazing children. Um, my eldest child, uh, her name is Claudia. She is seventeen years old, and then I have um, twins who will be fourteen next month in July. Uh, Samuel and Amalia. Um, and my daughter Amalia is transgender. Um, Amalia, I knew Amalia was transgender before Amalia knew Amalia was transgender. Um, my husband and I began having conversations about this when Amalia was, I don't know, three, maybe? And it started with, well, maybe maybe he's gay. Maybe, maybe we'll have a little fabulous little diva boy who will go shopping with his mama. Um, and I thought that I deserved that <laughs> because I grew up in the theater with not a single gay family member and I thought my time has come. Um, and, uh, <laughs> but God provides even better, right? <laughs> So um, as Molly grew up, uh, she kind of 
you know, my husband and I gave her this space to just try to figure out who she was, be who she was. Uh, we zipped up the dresses and we bought the pink backpack and we bought the, you know, hot pink tennis shoes and we just let her do her thing in South Louisiana, which, you know, we knew the risks that we were taking, but we also knew that if we didn't do that, the other risks we would be taking, right? And so we did what was right for our child and we let her lead the way. And she, um, eventually like put herself back in the closet and then came back out again at like 11 years old. And then we began a social transition. And right whenever we were like getting to the puberty age where we're ready to start puberty blockers, the Louisiana state legislature <laughs> made her existence illegal. And then we had to decide what to do. Um, and uh, my son, Samuel, her twin brother, said, well, if Amalia can't get the care she needs here, then we just have to move. And I think that that just says a whole, whole lot about who Sam is as a person. Because um, Sam uh, in Louisiana had a lot of really close friends and had a really strong little community and had all his little besties. And he was ready and willing to just pick up and move so that his sister could get what she needs. In the process, he gets his own bedroom for the first time, so I think that's also <laughs> like a really good thing for both of them. Uh, I was scared someone was going to die. <laughs> um, um, so, so that's how we got here. Uh, we, we kind of like looked at safe states and we're figuring out what our options were, and we were like, well, we can't afford to live here, we can't afford to live here. I mean, I'm a professional church lady, my husband works for a social services nonprofit, like we, we ain't got no money. So we were like, well, what are we gonna do? How do we make this happen? Um, but my brother lives here in the state of Washington. He lives in uh, Port Orchard. And so it was either here or Minnesota, and like I have rheumatoid arthritis, and so I was like, I'm not, moving there. Um, and so we decided to come here. And he let me stay with him for a little while after I found a job here. And we found a place in Polsbo. And the kids finished the school year. And then I went and snatched them away and brought them here just in the nick of time. Because I don't know if you're paying attention to the news, but the Louisiana state legislature is at it again, passing a whole slate of really awful legislation over the past week. So I'm really, really grateful that um, we we got out while we could and that we have a beautiful uh, support system that helped us to, to make that happen. So that's how we got here. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm a little long winded. So if you like get one of those shepherd's hooks, just pull me off if you need to. Uh, right, you're doing wonderfully. And uh, I do have a question, a really quick question. You know, you, you are the mom. I am. So you get to decide whether or not we ask Amelia and um, Sam to stand up. Oh, yeah, they can. If y'all could just stand up so everyone can see who you are. Samuel is saying no. Well, they're the two 13-year-olds in the room. <laughs> like, you can pretty much tell which ones they are. We so. are, yeah. We, we are making them uncomfortable. That is so pleasant. I know so it's pleasant. impolite to out people, but there they are. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Shannon, I want you to start us on the subject of what has finding community been like? Finding community. Well, it's interesting for me because, I mean, as you mentioned, I've always been in the theater community and living in Seattle. Um, I had so many friends on, I will use your term, on the queer and trans spectrum. And... Um, and when my daughter came out to me two days before high school, um, which was, I had the same experience as you. I th well, first of all, there's an interesting thing, which is that when we first moved to Bainbridge Island, my 
daughter wouldn't stop following around one of the performers that was in this play at the town square, and it was your daughter. And, <laughs> um, and I thought that she had a crush on her, but um, then I later learned that it was because she wanted to be her. She wanted to be like her, and so when she came out, um, I was lucky that I had friends and family and chosen family to call and say, um, how do I not screw this up? What are the right things to say? What are the, what are the things to do? How can I be the best mom in this situation? And I got all sorts of immediate feedback. And it was, um, I was so grateful, you know, because one of the things that was really difficult for me was that my daughter um, was first diagnosed with sensory processing issues, then diagnosed with ADHD, then diagnosed on the spectrum, then became um, selectively mute and then came out, oh, then came out as gay, and then came out as trans. And it felt like a lot. It felt like, wow, that's just, I'm piling up mothering things to think about and try to know how to do the right thing. And, um, and then I recently went to the trans friending support group. So even though I had my own community, um, their kids weren't my kid, right? And it was fascinating to go to this group and find out that that list is so common <laughs> that like, it isn't a bunch of different things on the list. It's all part of the same thing. And, um, you know, the other thing, you know, she also has a serious illness and she also is uh, physical illness. Um, and it's and she also has terrible depression um, that her coming out has really changed, which was amazing. So then I said to one of my friends who has a trans daughter, like, why didn't I see it? Why didn't I see it that when we went to a restaurant and somebody said, where would you ladies like to sit? Why didn't I see that that made her happy? Why didn't I do something about it? Why didn't I say something and just like you and just like my friend told me she was like Shannon you can't I knew my daughter was trans but I couldn't tell her you're trans go be trans and it was like oh right so I'm not <laughs> supposed to be guilty that I didn't see it but her being who she really is has been such an amazing experience, except that since she did it at uh, 14, um, she became more typical the further into our trans journey than she's ever been, which means that I am evil because I am the mother, right? So it's, it's a typical teen experience, whereas prior to that, she was very attached to me because she, she didn't have a place of belonging. And now that she is, yeah, she didn't, she wasn't able to be who she was. And now that she's able to be who she is, she is happy to be a typical teenager in the way that mothers get joy from. <laughs> so that's a double-edged sword, right? Where I'm like, I'm so glad you're happy enough to be really difficult right now. Um, so that's, um, yeah, finding community has helped me to, um, to realize that it, I'm, I'm not alone. Hello. And even, even with my friends, I didn't feel alone, but I felt like because of that big long list, I, there was some sort of aloneness. And it's like, no, there isn't. And, and so I'm really grateful to the community. Well, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you know, when you know, we say, "Come, come, join trans friending," and we're going to try to shock us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, thank you very much, Nick. If you can talk about how transition, both what's good and what's challenging or difficult, and is 
Shannon made you know clear that there's going to be a lot of difficulties. Yeah. How has it helped with your growth and the growth of your family? Thank you for that question. Also, thank you for your vulnerability around how hard it is to be the mom of anyone um, <laughs> at all, right? Um, and always trying to do it right. So I deeply appreciate your words. Um, specifically, um, my name is Nick. I work here at the museum. I have a uh, trans son uh, named Sam who was assigned female at birth and came out to me um, when he was 13 years old. I am a lesbian woman who uh, is a little bit genderqueer and I, I struggled with uh, Sam coming out to me at first, and I realized that I had to quickly um, deal with some of the subtle biases that I had and some of the homophobias that I had actually kind of been conditioned to have in my life. I grew up in a very small conservative town. Um, and I immediately started questioning him, like, was this was this because of your friends? Uh, is it a trend? Um, you know, and not realizing that this was his truth. And it took me very little time, but it seemed like too much time as his mother to um, to realize that he was telling me who he was. And there wasn't any question about that. Um, and any question that I had was questioning that. And all I needed to do was listen. Um, I needed to get out of my own way, and I needed to let go of a lot of that baggage of whether or not I'm doing it right or doing it wrong. Um, as a genderqueer person myself, um, my son and I bonded in a way that I had never been able to bond with him before because I understood what it was like to be misgendered. Um, there's even times now when people assume that I'm a man or will say, you know, he or along those lines, except that for me that causes a lot of personal shame. I have moments of uh, fear and anxiety around that. And in my son, now that he's being gendered correctly, you can see the joy. You can feel the joy of authenticity shining through. And so your question means the world to me because my son, through his transition, has taught me how to become more comfortable with who I am. And then secondarily, when I look at other people now, whoever you are, I just see you. I've tried to let go of so many of those biases, and when they creep up, and they do creep up, because I'm a human, um, I'm able to more quickly let them go, and I find that my relationships with other people are more genuine and more fruitful because I'm seeing them for who they are, and I'm listening to who they are telling me that they are. And that's something that I, I feel deeply in my heart is resonating that this will only continue to bear really beautiful, positive fruit for me. And I can't express enough how much my son's transition, although scary, because as his mom, I don't want anyone to hurt him. I don't want people to talk down to him. I don't want him to not be able to get medical care or find a home or get a good job. But that doesn't matter. What matters is that he is truly himself and able to express that. And through him doing that, honestly, he's taught me more about how to live a more authentic, joyous life. And so now when I see other trans people, it brings me joy because it's just another person shining that light. And I wish I could, in a motherly way, um, wrap my arms around all those kids and just say, shine on, you guys shine on in all of the ways. And especially like you had mentioned, um, the spectrum, the other artist who was here who had said about the, um, the spectrum with inside, there you are, thank you, the spectrum from with inside the trans community. You're not just trans, period. There's, there's ways of being as well, and I love every unique one of them. So thank you for that question. Well, thank you for that wonderful answer. All right, so we're gonna come back to Etienne, and we're going to ask you, what is finding, you know, you had community in Louisiana. You had to leave what was a supportive community in Louisiana. Yes. What um, does communi finding community mean to you? Um, we're really lucky uh, in that we came from a family who loved us no matter what, you know? Uh, my husband's family, though they're, they're very much the type of people who will say, I don't understand it, but I don't need to. I love you, which is great. Um, my family, we're a bunch of like crazy liberals, so it was just, you know, 
just a, another day at the office for my family. Like it was just, we are who we are. But, um, except for one family member, my father, who I didn't really have a strong relationship with before. Um, he and I stopped talking before Molly, um, really was a fully formed human. And so it didn't really matter. Um, but like our chosen family, you know, our, our church family and our theater family, um, we, we've always had such a strong community. I mean, the first place Amalia ever felt comfortable, um, the first two places were at the theater and at church. You know, she wore her sparkly, white, beautiful dress to midnight mass for Christmas, and everyone told her she looked beautiful, and nobody batted an eye. Um, you know, we had... Uh, a few um, trans and non-binary people in our congregation in South Louisiana, so they converted two of the single-stall restrooms to gender-neutral rest restrooms. And, you know, they, we, the Episcopal Church, which is I am and my family are part of, is um, very open and accepting and affirming. And so we've been very, very fortunate to have that type of community in our lives. Um, and it's been extremely difficult to leave it um, by force, really, you know, it was not something that we were looking to do or excited to do. We had our lives. I mean, my husband is pushing 50 and he's never lived outside of Louisiana ever in his life. And so whenever we move here, we, I mean, we're leaving our parents and our siblings and our jobs and communities to make sure that our kid gets what she needs. But luckily, the Episcopal Church is the Episcopal Church pretty much wherever you go. And so by finding a job at an Episcopal Church, it's like you just have this built-in amazing community, <laughs> like from go, you know? You don't have to start from scratch uh, whenever you, you get somewhere. And oddly enough, I went from working at a church called St. Barnabas Episcopal Church in Lafayette, Louisiana, to working at St. Barnabas Episcopal Church on Bainbridge Island. <laughs> so it's like, I don't even have to change the way I answer the phone. Um, I do the exact same thing there that I do here. Uh, so it's, it's been really, I mean, if I wasn't such a person of faith, I probably would be now, you know? Like, it's just such a, a beautiful, divine, gorgeous thing that has happened in our lives. Um, so the way that I find community is both through like shuffle ball changing at the theater um, and through my faith. That's uh, something that is really, really important to me and my husband and to our kids. I mean, like they might put up a fight about having to go to youth group, but they still come, mainly because I run the youth group. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. And, you know, if, if you haven't caught on now, if you want another theater connection, she's sitting right next to you. <laughs> this is, you know, I told you that we, you know, that, that Rainbow Crew is about connections. Okay. And theater connection. We're going to ask you, Shannon, how, because you were, you know, you sort of ended on all the, the, the whole list of things. So how's you know the good and the bad and the ugly worked and your growth and and your um, growth as a family? Yes. Um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that my daughter is no longer so suicidal that we're afraid every single day, which is how we lived from third grade until she came out. That's the best part. Um, I miss her. I would love to have the relationship that we had, and I hope it will come back someday. That's the worst part. I mean, she really is one, uh, one of the most amazing human beings I've ever met. And, you know, I am a little biased, but I really, really miss her. So that's the bad. Um, and... Uh, but the good is that uh, she came out while my husband and I had been separated for eight years, and we um, we made the decision at the time that we separated that we 
no matter what, we're going to do it differently than we had seen a lot of our friends do it, which was that she came first, no matter what. And during the toughest times, um, that was a constant. And her coming out made it, I don't know, so much easier for us to communicate because we realized, wait, even though we've been through all of these challenges together, um, this isn't one of them. This is something that we're both behind. This is something that we, you know, it was like I, I was kind of sad when I didn't have a gay son, um, too, like I, because I, I really thought that I, that we would be the best parents for our gay child. And, and it was like, so that when she came out to us, um, we sat, because she sat us down for dinner, and we were so nervous. What is it? What is the thing she needs to tell us? What is this big, dark, scary thing she's going to tell us? And, it, and she told us, and we said, oh, thank God. And she was upset that we were supportive <laughs> because she had prepared a speech. And <laughs> we were like, um, do you want to say the speech? And she was like, well, why would I say it to you? And I, it was like, okay, I'm sorry that I blew your speech. Like, I really, really am. And so, you know, that was, that's the good part is that it's really brought us together. As uh, my husband and I, it has brought us together. We both miss her. She is, um, you know, she's spreading her wings a bit, and I want her to do that and have the space to do that. And I choose um, our relationship with her over um, pushing in this arena or that arena, you know? And it, it's, it, it's academically, for example, where it's like, I, she has so much going on right now. I, I really don't care about that math assignment. I'm sorry. Like, I just can't care about it right now. And, um, and so I think that's part of the bad, is that, you know, I, it, the, the people who don't know. They haven't either had any lived experience or they don't have fam friends and family members so that they can understand and the things that they say um, scare me, right? It scares me. I mean, wow, like Louisiana, that scares me. It scares me where she wants to go and who she you know, wants to be with. Um, but I wouldn't change it for the world. I want her to be who she is is and i can see that happiness i'm just sad that she doesn't want to share it with me yet and i'm going to stay hopeful that that yet is true well thank you very much i really appreciate the way you are out to, you know handling this and you're doing wonderfully and nick the two questions that you haven't you know we didn't ask you were either how does community work with you, or um, yeah. how did you get here? And you can answer either one or both. Okay. Well, I, I'll make it somewhat short and sweet. Um, uh, I will answer the community question okay. uh, specifically, and that is because um, I think that one of the things that we can do is, as trans parents, um, support each other um, through the knowns and the unknowns and the unknown unknowns. <laughs> Um, that we may be going through. Um, on Bainbridge Island specifically, and in Kitsap County, where I have been able to find the most authentic and supportive communities for both myself and my son, have been through the Kitsap Regional Library, specifically the Bainbridge Kitsap Regional Library, um, although any and all of them are open and affirming spaces, safe spaces for young people, and spaces where you can find research, spaces where you can find stories and you can find other community members. Um, and secondly, here at the museum, 
Um, the I have wonderful coworkers um, and patrons who come in who have supported me and educated me, and the artists who show here who have helped me expand my mind and my perception of what it means to be a trans person in the world right now, and to figure out how to develop community. But I think something that we do need to do is to try to not be afraid um, and I get that, like we just said, caring for our children and, and having that, you know, flight or fight kind of experience is to um, to build it together. And through simple conversations like this, we help do that. And so, you know, I will just put it out there that I work here. And if any of you ever want to come talk with me or know someone who might want to come talk with me, please send them my way. And if that doesn't feel right, again, I can't express enough how much the public library is such an easy space to go to. And it's a space where you're gonna find love and acceptance and and support. Um, so that's what I have to say about that. And I'm, I'm very grateful for, uh, I just wanna make clear here that the library is very supportive and is one reason why libraries are under attack. Um, theater, I mean theater. <laughs> Um, and churches, we have done programs here at BIMA and in our you know, pride festivals and other places where we make sure that we give voice to the churches, that you know, we know that there are an incredible number of people in the queer and trans community who are spiritual and or religious. And we need to find ways to make them feel acknowledged. Yes, because so many of, of them have experienced spiritual trauma and yes. religious trauma that goes unaddressed, yes. right? And so it's very important, I mean, for me, as someone who works for a church, to provide space for people to heal from those hurts that the church has inflicted in the past and to take ownership and responsibility for what has been done in the past. You know, it's, it's awful. Um, and to, to put words to it and say that it's awful and that we can do better and we have to do better moving forward, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm so grateful to hear that the libraries are awesome because in Louisiana, they're <laughs> not yeah, they are. like our library in my community tried to have a drag queen story time and these crazy people came and took over the library board of control and now it's like a you know what show over there. Like it's a disaster and they've had to take down any kind of reasonable displays of books and literature. They're clearing out any kind of LGBTQ voices out of libraries in Louisiana. It's just, it's, it's really, very Handmaid's Tale <laughs> down there, you guys. It's very frightening. So I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad to hear about the library. I've already got my library card, so go I'll get two. <laughs> All right. I honestly think that my three questions are you know, pretty much addressed. I want to ask a different last question, and we'll start with Nick on this, because you know she was, go she was going towards where I Apparently, I'm just going to follow. I'm not, you know, it's not, I didn't have a last question. As I said, this is a welcoming. And so the question is, how would you welcome another trans parent of a trans kid? What would you say to them? Um, well, <clears throat> it's going to be okay. And that all you have to do is be loving. And sometimes loving can be challenging, but that's all you have to do. And um, I think more than anything, meeting another trans parent, and I just want to underline this, maybe bold it, um, community together, ask questions, say what's on your heart. Let's clear the air. Let's talk about the things that we need to talk about so that we can be the best parents that we want to be so that we can be authentic, so that we can be sincere. So I would open up with that. I would say, it's gonna be okay. 
and lead with love. And if things get scary, lead with curiosity. Thank you. Shannon? I think you spoke to it earlier, and my thing wouldn't be to speak, it would be to listen, right? Um, because I think that just like every trans person's experience is different and what it means to each person, I mean, let's face it, it's a trans person, person, human, each person, the experience is different and we often don't feel heard. And so I would listen to what their concerns were and, you know, and then see what connections we make. And, you know, and if I can't connect, then, you know, the bigger my community gets, the, the more people I know, hey, you know who should, you should talk to. So-and-so has been through that. So. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think it's gonna be okay is a great jumping off point. Um, and just to let them know that I, I feel like for me, the most important part of our journey was just providing the space for exploration. Um, that it is, uh, when it comes to gender, uh, identity and expression, there, um, the spectrum is so broad that sometimes it takes a lot of time to figure out where you fall on that spectrum. And sometimes it shifts and changes over time for people who aren't just like, I was born a girl, I'm a girl, I've always been a girl, I'm always gonna be a girl. You know, like that's how I've always been. There's nothing different about that for me. But I understand that not everybody's like that. Um, and so as long as you approach it uh, and other human beings with the idea that um, there is no timeline and there is no um, set goal, right? Uh, I have a niece who for a number of years used a different name, used different pronouns, and then shifted back. That's okay. The only problem that I had with that was that her last name is Perry and the name she chose was Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> so she was Tyler Perry. Um, so it was a choice. Uh, but she came back to being her given name. Um, so I think, you know, you just have to give grace, and also communicating with the person who is transitioning and letting them know that everyone else is transitioning with them. Like, whenever Amalia began to transition, I told her, um, and it was, it was easier because she didn't yet have those like very heavy pubescent hormones raging through her body. She was younger, um, and so it was easier to say, hey, girl, uh, let's just have a little bit of patience with people. When someone misgenders you, you gently correct them, right? There's no need to get angry. It, this is gonna take everybody a lot of time to adjust. We are all transitioning together, right? So let's just approach it with grace and give people grace, provide that to them, because they're providing it to you as well. It's this reciprocal thing. And so just having those conversations, and like you said, just putting it all out there and putting words to what you're feeling and not just like bottling everything up. I think that just making sure that those lines of communications are open are really, really key. Well, I'm so grateful to all three of you for putting yourselves on the line here. This has been a wonderful experience for me. I learn things every time. One thing I learned of is here today is trust mom. Mom is usually right. 
Make sure they know. <laughs> Are they going to listen to me? No. No. They might because you're not their mom. Yeah, that's a possibility. I am, Sarah, I am so grateful that we use this as the background because it really does speak to what Greg was talking about. I am again grateful immensely for the other artists, um, Clara and Felix, you know, this, and, and Felix's aunt. I'm sorry, I can't remember your name. <laughs> um, I don't usually remember my daughter's names, so that's, you know, it's nothing unusual. I think that you've spoken with a lot of wisdom, talking about curiosity, talking about listening, talking about grace. You know, these are really important things that when we have public discussions about the queer and trans community, we so rarely get the chance to say what we mean, and which is we mean these words. You know, we get caught in a battle when what we really are are talking about curiosity, listening, and grace, and people are not that far apart on those values. So I thank you very much, and now, Nick, you get to get up here and, you know, sign us off. Uh, yeah, I've, I've even got my own mic right here. So, um, yeah, thank you guys so much for your listening, and thank you and all of that. Please enjoy the reception, drink some, eat some, take a closer look at these artworks, and thank you again for attending this program. For sure. You're so well. You're so well.